Shortly after my sixth birthday, mom packed the three of us up and moved us a million miles away to Ames, where she started her studies in architecture. We lived for one year in an apartment right next to my school, and then we moved across town to a similar apartment, but it wasn't next to the school. It was right next to the railroad tracks. And on the opposite side of the complex from the tracks, there was a graveyard. A few yards behind the apartment complex, there was um, an unnaturally bright rainbow colored pond. Nothing grew by that pond. And my friends and I used to hike out there to wonder what it was and remind each other not to fall in. Even six and seven year olds know better. Um, we roamed around the neighborhood. We played on the tracks. We climbed to the roof of an old school, school building, an abandoned school building that was in our neighborhood. Our mothers, every one of them had to work or go to class. And our older brothers babysat us, which really means that we were completely unsupervised, <laughs> completely unsupervised. We were the original latchkey kids. And I came to think of myself as one of the throwaway humans. It's not that my parents didn't love me. I had plenty of evidence that they did. But society didn't care one way or the other whether I fell in that pond or got run over by the train. They did very little to ensure that the housing project I lived in had barriers between me and the toxic sludge. I do vaguely remember a fence, but the best fence, the one that you couldn't possibly climb, was the one that blocked the view between us and the middle-class neighbors next door. And um, the one in the back, I think it was chain link. I barely remember it. It was laughably easy to get past. You could go under it, you could go over it. It hardly counted as a fence. Uh, so there we were, unsupervised in a neighborhood next to the tracks. And whatever that, was it sewage? Was it toxic waste? I don't know. So our society did very little for us, very little to ensure that mother could afford childcare. My younger sister was very young and she had someone to watch her before and after school, preschool. I had childcare for one year and then I turned seven and no longer had childcare. I walked to and from school a mile each way because mom didn't like the school in our new neighborhood. So I went to the school that we had lived next to previously. And nobody did anything to ensure that my older brother had anything interesting to do after school. So, he was charged with babysitting me. A 12-year-old boy wants to watch his 8-year-old sister once, let alone every day. And there were no adults in sight. What could possibly be wrong with this picture? Did David ever come home from school? No. And who can blame him? He had, he had his own life to live, and he was 12. 13 and you know then we moved out of that neighborhood but it was a it was you know it wasn't that tough a neighborhood but it sent this message you know that some people are unnoticeable and some people are maybe disposable and then so i read this this scripture and I identify with the branch that gets cut off. All right, well, nothing catastrophic occurred, but I did 
think of myself and my family as completely unimportant to the rest of the world. And I think that the people that built the housing project meant well. They were providing housing for the poor. But they were human. They were human just like you and just like me. And they failed to take into account the actions of squirrely little kids with desperate families. And they and we are very lucky that none of us actually fell through the train bridge or got run over or fell into that whatever it was in that pond because the pond itself wasn't fenced. There was just a fence to keep people supposedly in the apartment complex. Okay, so switching gears here. One day I realized that there was another message that I was hearing. We were a church going family, always. And the churches we attended were huge with robust, giant Sunday school programs. Every Sunday school class had one age in it. You were in first grade, you went to first grade Sunday school. If you were in second grade, you went to second grade Sunday school. Plenty of Sunday school. And the message that they repeated in every single grade was this one. God loves you. God loves me. God loves you. God loves everyone. And God will take care of you no matter what. So what happens with those branches that get cut off? What if they didn't want to be cut off? What if they didn't want to be swept up and sent away? Didn't God love them? I needed those branches to not get cut off because I was one of the people who'd been broken off. So I avoided thinking about this scripture for 50 years. And then I offered to preach. And this was the scripture in the lectionary. Desiree told me I could pick something else. Susan told me I could pick something else. Ren told me I could pick something else. But it feels like it's time. And God assigned it to me to wrestle with. So now we get to my conclusions. I went and talked to Matt Crane about this word that gets translated as cut off. Uh, so I believe the Gospel of John was written in Greek. And he looked up the Greek for me. It's the word Iro, and it has a million meanings. It has nuances that you would not believe. And I'm going to start with the most dramatic and work my way to the one I like the best. Okay? So Iro means to kill, destroy, remove, cut off, take up, carry, bear, raise, and lift up. What? Can I just say I'd like a word with the translators? Why would they choose cut off? Well, maybe those branches are going to get grafted. I don't know. But anyway, so it could mean anything from chopping branches off and putting them fresh into the blender all the way to lifting them off the ground and tying them to the armature. Who knows? Maybe it's all of them. But you know what? God can make new life out of all of these things. Right In Ezekiel, we've got the Valley of the Dry Bones where all the skeletons come back to life and become humans again. If God can do that, then, you know, I guess I can trust that when I feel like I've been cut off the tree, he'll put me back in a spot where I can grow. <laughs> okay so here's what i know about growing fruit grapevines do require support See, i'm kind of all over the place but i had a really hard time with this oh thank you have you ever been walking through the woods in september and you smelled grapes 
and then looked to see where they were. Yeah, cat's got it. Wild grapes find a tree to climb and they grow as tall as they can, way up into the canopy, and they produce their grapes way up there, out of reach if you don't have a tall ladder with you. In a vineyard, they want to make it so that you can reach the grapes. So they take a cross-shaped thing. Sometimes it's got one cross, and sometimes it's got two, and they run horticultural wire and they plant the plants along the horticultural wire. So there's your vine and the branches run along the wire and they're supported. But grapes can, grapes can reproduce in several ways. And one of the ways is layering. So if there's a branch on the ground, it's likely to sprout roots. And then it draws, while it's producing these roots and extra branches, it draws energy away from grape production. And so the gardener either cuts it off or lifts it up and ties it to the wire. So it becomes a producing branch instead of a root producing branch. Yeah. And once those branches are all tied to the wire, pruning decisions are easy. Grapes get pruned really heavily. It's Let's see, I wrote it down here because I'm not ac actually a grape expert. Anything that's not growing along the wire gets trimmed off. And then a certain number of the buds, all but like two or three, along the branches that are on the wire get pruned off. So grapes get pruned really heavily. And they have to be if they're going to produce good yields of grapes. All right, so then I was thinking... I grow raspberries, I grow black raspberries, and I prune them even more heavily. Every February I go out there, I take out the dead stems, and then I cut everything back to about two feet tall, right? And if you don't do that, they don't produce very well. And it keeps them, keeps them healthy because there's plenty of air circulation. So, Grapes and raspberries have this in common. The new fruit grows on growth that came off of one-year-old canes or one-year-old branches. And all of this year's fruit will be on those sprouts. It, focus, it forces the plant to focus on the fruit production. Does it hurt? It's probably brutal. I think it probably, you know, I don't know how plants feel. They don't have the same senses I do, but I suspect there's something because they're alive, right? They're not just rocks sitting on the ground, you know? And, um, and so it probably hurts. And I think, you know, the things I've been through and the things you've been through, that's that's probably your pruning and it hurts you know but then he's also god you know is looking for people that are a little droopy right he's looking to lift us up and tie us to a support and that might hurt too because you're being forced into a new position right maybe we have some ideas or some activities that don't help us and he finds ways to remove those things, right? And if, you know, you come to the end of it and you're not refreshed the way you used to be, maybe God takes that thing off, you know, whatever it was that isn't helping you. Yeah. And then you bear fruit. You bear the fruit God wants you to bear. Can you see it? You can't see it. You're a branch. I'm a branch. I can't see my fruit. I don't have the senses to see my fruit. I don't have the senses to see your fruit. 
And that might be part of why I have such a hard time with this. Because I want to look around and say, okay, here's something great that I did. And that's something horrible that was done to me. And this is, you know, and, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what my fruit is. I just know that God is in charge. God's doing the pruning. God's cleaning me up. God's lifting me up. And God's forcing me into the position I need to be in. And I have to trust that God is going to take good care of me because I can't see. I can't see the beginning. I can't see the end. I can't see the middle. All I can do is just do my darndest to stay connected to the branch, stay connected to the trunk, right, to Jesus, and let the sap of God's love flow through me and hopefully develop the best things that God can possibly get out of me. Amen. Amen.